The 1990s was one of the most turbulent periods in Celtic's long history and in the battle to save Celtic series so far we've spoken to several of the key figures involved before Fergus McCann ultimately took control in March 1994. It's now 30 years ago this month since those dramatic events took place and to help provide a very unique perspective on events I'm delighted to be joined here on the Celtic Exchange by former Celtic director Tom Grant, a man who sat on Celtic's board from 1985 right up until the 1994 takeover. Tom, welcome to the Celtic Exchange. Does it feel like 30 years since those turbulent times? In some ways it does. In other ways it becomes a... When I, when I go to the games and I see things, it's a it's fresh in your mind how things were working out. But yes, it's a, been a long time, but good times. Good, good stuff. Time. Tom, your family connection with Celtic goes way back almost to the, the very foundations of the club and your great-grandfather, James Grant, was elected onto the very first Celtic board in 1897. Um, I presume then that Celtic must have been something that was just in and around you and your family from a, a very young age. It was. Been, um, what, since I was a kid, we stayed in Cardown. Um, with my mother's mother, my, the McNamara's. Um, so the, the football connection was always pretty prominent, but my one dad was in the Merchant Navy. Um, he was away for months on end. Um, so he knew that I was football daft. So in those days, I was dispatched over to an old uncle in Bothell, who was a Motherwell fan. <laughs> so my early days were, I was taken to Fir Park and still have the Motherwell scarf to to prove it um, but then <laughs> it was quite funny one day I was sitting in the stand and I'd gone down to the catering unit for a pie at half time and there was a guy beside me or behind me in the queue uh, an older man and he said to me I had my mother with scarf on and he said to me, where are you from son and I said Cardown what the heck are you doing supporting mother will come from Cardown so I, I just said I've, I've always supported mother I was only like 10 or something like that mm. And when I went back home, I said to my gran and my mum, this man had said that from Cardown, I, I shouldn't be supporting Motherwell, she was a Celtic fan. Of course, my gran and my mum said, man's quite right. Um, so I was then put into the care of various family relations and taken to Celtic Park on a regular basis after that. So the man in the pie still changed your life Changed forever. my life, yeah. yep. Um, I'd mentioned, obviously, uh, your great-grandfather, James, and... I guess there must have been a real sense of pride, Tom, in the family that he'd played such a, a key role in the, the very early years of Celtic. There was. I mean, I, I, I've always been keen to try and find out more about the family. And as I say, we, we've gone over to Tomb, Tomb House, Tomb Bridge, um, and we got in touch with the, the Aunt Felicia who who lived there at the time. And my dad, unfortunately, being in the Merchant Navy, we didn't have the contact that we, that we could have done. Um, but I was always keen to find out about my great-grandfather in particular. Um, the grandfather that I was named after, Thomas Joseph, seems to be a bit, bit elusive. So I didn't really get to know him at all before he died. Um, and then when my dad, dad passed away in 1979, Desmond White kindly invited me to go into the boardroom. Um, and really from 1979 onwards, I was in the boardroom, uh, lucky enough to be able to travel with the team um, to the away games, both in Scotland and abroad which was an, a, a privilege and a, an exciting time. So, and just, Well, just in terms of your, your Celtic support and stuff, before we, we get right up to the, the boardroom part of it, um, you'll have come through, I suppose, Lisbon Lions stuff and Celtics nine in a row and 10 men won the league, all these kind of things. Any any standout memories or players from those those times? The first nine in a row. Yeah, the original. <laughs> um, the, the standout times really would be going back to Lisbon when we were only kids and it was black and white TVs. Um, uh, we enjoyed going round. Um, the fact that we came from Cardown, we, we, we'd take off down to Steps, which wasn't such a, a Celtic area. So we enjoyed um, allowing them to enjoy our celebrations. Uh, so all of those kind of things, the, the the various cup ones, the first cup final I was ever at was the 65 cup final I was taken to against Infirma. Billy McNeil's header. Billy, Billy, Billy's header. Um, so that was the first real experience of an uncle taking me and my cousin to the to the game, sitting on a, a barrier at the back of the Celtic end and then joining the crowd in the, the atmosphere. Yeah, and you've obviously had some great things, you know, beyond then, you know, Steen's years and, and certainly after that. Um, just to go back then to the family connection, and, you, and you've uh, name-checked Felicia already, so there used to be a, a bit of a fairy tale, you know, during, you know, times past that there was this, this wee woman in Ireland who basically owned Celtic and it turned out that it wasn't completely untrue and actually fairly close to the truth in some ways so can you tell us a wee bit about Felicia Grant and, and the story that I'm, I'm leaning towards? Well, 
<coughs> when when her father died and uh, the uncle Tom Colgan had died, or my uncle, uh, my, my dad's uncle Tom Colgan had died, she inherited his, uh, the shares, um, and she lived in Tomb House. Uh, I believe her brother lived with her for a for a long time as well. Um, right on the banks of Loch Ney, a lovely, lovely spot overlooking the loch, which is, I think it's the biggest freshwater lake in um, this part of the world. Uh, and she was very proud of the Celtic connection. She had a, a, a photograph, that was the same of the replica of John Thompson mm-hmm. that Celtic had at Celtic Park. She had the same photograph up in her mantelpiece. She was her favourite. But she was lucky enough to go away with Celtic in the days when they went to America, in the early days. I think they did a tour of... Uh, Germany and Austria and um, parts of Europe at that time. Um, she was lucky enough to go with them. So she had great experiences that she, she thoroughly enjoyed. And then when she got a little bit older, she was more or less housebound and she died in a nursing home in Belfast. And I believe, and you can maybe correct me if I'm wrong there, she was at the time the third largest shareholder in Celtic after the, the White and Kelly family. So after Felicia passes away, I believe the shares then passed into your own father, is that correct? They passed to my dad. Um, Bob Kelly had kept in touch with Felicia and occasionally visited her uh, in the nursing home in Belfast and that was really to ensure that uh, he retained the control of her vote. And um, in fact, when when she died and um, the shares passed to my dad, they, there was a, a question mark over whether they were going to challenge the the, the inheritance, if you like. Um, but my dad had a, an uncle who was a lawyer and um, made sure that his shareholding was protected. And, and the shares between your dad, they ended up some in Canada, some stayed yeah. in the north of Ireland and some different places? Yeah, the, the, there's a, a family called Doherty that inherited some of the shares. Um, he became involved. I'd never met any of them, but they they came on the scene later on. Um, uh, it was, I think it was maybe five or six nephews and nieces that inherited that, uh, uh, an equal share each. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other half of the shares of my dad was given the, the, the half, okay. uh, which eventually came into my father. And we'll maybe get to some of the kind of finer detail a wee bit later on, but were, were those shares eventually acquired by the, the kind of rebel consortium, to call them that? Did they end up getting control rather than Kelly's at that time? Uh, <clears throat> when it became the, to the kind of Conflict time, yes. David Lowe came in, mm. um, and David's job was to acquire as many shares as possible for the, for the group, uh, which he did very successfully. Mm. Um, whether it be a small shareholder or some of the larger shareholders, um, it was quite a task because these people were spread to the wind, and um, I still have a list, believe it or not, of virtually every shareholder okay. that we ever had. And some people had fully paid up shares, mm-hmm. and others had shares that were only partially paid up. Um, so that meant the share capital was pretty small. Mm-hmm. Um, but regardless, uh, to get the, the main shares, the, the fully paid shares, which carried the full vote, was the, the important thing to get. Yeah, and, and we've, we spoke to David um, just in, in part two of this series, and he gives a lot of detail as to how that all played out. And yeah, he was travelling to the, the four corners of the globe to yeah, try and acquire... So. Canada, the States, certainly Ireland and, and various other places. So, And we'll cover more of that a, a, a wee bit later on. Um, what about your, your route to becoming a director then, Tom? You've mentioned that Chris White introduces you around about 1979. You get more involved, I suppose, behind the scenes at Celtic. And you ultimately become a director in 1985. And again, I'm sure there was a great sense of pride in, in taking your place at Celtic. I'd, um, I tried to get on the board. After my dad died, I, I was frequently in the boardroom every match day. And I'd asked once before um, uh, Desmond White whether I could go on the board or not. And he said it was too soon um, to give it a bit more time. But I became very friendly with Tom Devlin, who'd been a friend of my dad's and an, another director. And I used to meet uh, Tom Devlin in Edinburgh um, quite occasionally for a wee lunch. Um, and Tom obviously was a big influence in Desmond. And uh, eventually um, I got called into Desmond's offices in Bath Street and he said to me that he was happy to me, for me to join the board, um, which I did not believe. I think it was the 6th of March in 1985, which was before a reserve game in the boardroom, before a reserve game at Celtic Park. So uh, then, of course, it had to be uh, clarified and uh, authenticated at <coughs> an, an EGM, but mm-hmm. that all just took a wee bit of time. Yeah, interesting it's the 6th of March because we're 
basically this series came about because we're marking the 4th of March, which was 30 years to the day since Ferguson's takeover. So obviously a lot going on at that time of year, Celtic-wise. Um, you joined that board uh, in 1985 and it consists at that time of Kevin Kelly, Chris White, Jack McGinn and Jimmy Farrell. I mean, Celtic at that point, fast approaching the centenary season, there's there's some notable success on the park. So obviously Love Street 86, not long after you join, centenary double 1988, Joe Muller Cup final 1989. Um, but sadly, it's then to be six years until Celtic win another trophy with the 95 Scottish Cup. Were the board at that time, Tom, aware or increasingly aware of the pressures that Rangers were putting on? They were obviously taking a different direction, a different approach through, I think, originally Lauren Smalborough and then David Murray. Essentially living beyond their means, but it was allowing that we put notably some England internationals and different players in the park. Were you feeling that pressure? Were you aware of, of what they were doing? But very much so, because... Um they, they brought in fairly large players, obviously. They, they, they had a bit of an advantage at the time because uh, they had access to money, funds that we didn't have. Our, our share capital, as I mentioned previously, was something in the region of, uh, I think, 30,000 in total or something, like 30,000 pounds, mm. uh, made up of the fully paid up shares of a pound and partially paid up shares. So that meant that your access to borrowing funds was extremely limited and bank, banks were very un unwilling to give you something to such a limited company as ours was. Um, Rangers managed to find a purse uh, from somewhere and they had the advantage that players uh, from England had been banned from playing in Europe. Mm. So some of them were willing to come and play in Scotland and get the chance to play in Europe. They also had the, the situation going on and, and Jim Orr covered this in his episode, the fact that the Ibrox disaster, which I think was in 1971, huge tragedy, it instigated or led to Rangers developing what become an all-seater stadium kind of ahead of its time you know quite a futuristic place to 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 be uh, and obviously it attracted you know bigger fan bases than they'd, they'd had previously and in turn you know money comes with that and do you think again that gave them a bit of strength a bit of bargaining power that Celtic just didn't have at the time? It, it did it meant that funds didn't have to be put into the stadium um, I, I became involved in the various um, improvements that we had to make at the stadium um, and they could be anything from just replacing turnstiles to crush barriers to repairing anything at all. It was an old stadium. It was a, a stadium that had, had fairly big crowds, so it was under a bit of pressure at times. And um, finding a budget to be able to do that was a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we were very, very fortunate at the time that the Football Trust was helping. And one of our allies in that was a guy who many Celtic fans at the time wouldn't believe was Tom Wharton, the next referee. Tiny. Tiny Wharton. Yeah. Um, and Tiny was the, the Scottish representative for the Football Trust, and his help was amazing. Um, I, I had to fill out, um, I feel like, a list, a shopping list of things that we wanted to do, get it funded, um, and then get a percentage from them, which we were very successful. And he, he took me down to the offices in London and introduced me to the people that would organise that for us. And he couldn't have been more helpful. Yeah. So he deserves his place in Celtic he history somewhere. Does. One way or another. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so I've mentioned the fact that Celtic, you know, we had those successes towards the late 80s, but it becomes apparent that we're starting to slip behind. And as I say, it's not till 95 that we pick up the Scottish Cup and it's further down the track before Wim Janssen manages just to stop the 10. So you've mentioned your nine in a row. Yes, the original one, 65 to 74, and then Rangers one, which... Wasn't so pleasant for you, I'm sure. Before we get into a bit more detail, Tom, on, on takeovers, stadiums, rebel groups and all that kind of stuff, there's a certain Mo Johnson episode at that time I'd, I'd like to cover if you're happy to do so. So it's an episode which rocks Scottish football in July 1989. You're obviously very close to the story at that time. So could you tell us your, your version of events from the Celtic boardroom? Uh, when it came down, the first news we got of the, the re-interest in Michael and Morris Johnson wanting to come to Celtic was a phone call that had come in to me at Celtic Park um, from a guy who ran one of the nightclubs in Glasgow, a guy called John Quigley, who uh, had heard through the grapevine that Morris wanted to come back to Celtic. So I, I passed that on to, to, to Jack and, and to Billy, Billy McNeil, um, and let them take it, take it forward. Um, it turned out the guy was willing to come back so negotiations started to try and pull him back and as I remember his, his agent was um, Bob McMurdo um, not the most helpful of people um, and not the biggest of Celtic fans so at that point Morris had signed a, a pre-contract agreement mm -hmm. um, and 
we had gone to, I think it was might have been a a press club dinner or one of these football sports dinners. I think it was at the Albany Hotel at the time. And um, one of the guys came over to me and said, Morris Johnson is over there signing autographs. And he's signing them, Morris Johnson Rangers Football Club. So obviously that caused a wee bit of uh, concern and we investigated a little bit further and found out that there was a, uh, various th other things happening behind the scenes that we weren't aware of and that he was in fact signing for Rangers. So we decided at the time we had to make a, a decision either withhold his, the signature that he'd given us, uh, which um, I believe uh, UEFA said was uh, legal, legal mm -hmm. and binding. So we had to make a decision whether to release him from that or withhold his signature. And eventually we thought it would be churlish to hold on to it, so we released them and let them go to where he went. Yeah, so there's obviously, there was there was a famous, now famous picture at the time. He's he's wearing the Celtic strip, he's with Billy McNeil. He's, it's just about done and dusted. So, I mean, was it was it too soon to release that picture? Was everything kind of done and dusted? Or did you say, Tom, was there a legal document there that, that you thought would bound him at the club? At the time when I think that photograph was taken and the, that kind of build up to that was everybody felt that everything was done and dusted that he, he was in fact going to sign he was there with his his girlfriend his his friends were about the place um, at that time we had no inclination that anything was wrong and it was only after that that things started to but we started to become aware of things in the background happening mm -hmm. and taking away the, the legalities of it all I suppose even maybe just asking you to put your your fan head on for a moment were you finding it hard to get your head around the movie that actually made I was disgusted by him. Yeah. Um, it's, bad, it's bad enough um, doing to Celtic what he did, but to go where he went, um, obviously most Celtic fans would agree that that was a a pretty horrible thing to do. Um, and he wasn't even welcomed by the majority of the Rangers support at the time. Yeah, I think there was there's footage at the time of Rangers fans up in arms outside Ibrox yeah. saying they were going yeah. to burn their season tickets and that yeah. was the end for them because of his, his religious background. No, it, it wasn't a... Uh, he was a, a strange character um, and at times when he was in the tunnel going out to, at Celtic Park he wasn't always uh, the nicest of people before he went out onto the park mm. And do you think the move just purely money motivated because uh, if you had a step back and thought about it I don't, I don't know where Morris Johnson lives now if he's out in the States I know he went there for a time but even now we're 30 years down the track he can't walk down Sucky Hill Street, can I? I wouldn't have thought so. Um, not with his head held high anyway. He would probably need to wear quite a, quite a disguise. Um, that's something he's got to live with. I'm sure his bank account is, is healthy enough for him to be able to live with it, but um, if you want to live that way, that's in, entirely up to him. It wouldn't be for me. Yeah, but just a, a very strange move and just one of a, of a number of things kind of rocking the boat at, you know, that, at yeah. that time. Um, to go back to, you know, something... Towards the stadium, Tom. So following the the Hillsborough disaster, which was April nineteen eighty nine, the Taylor report comes out, and that dictates that all uh, clubs must, or all clubs in the top flight, must have all seater stadiums uh, by nineteen ninety four. How much did that ruling effectively alter the course of Celtic's history? It, it simply meant that we had to change Celtic Park um, one way or another, whether we liked it or not. We had to find funds um, either to rebuild Celtic Park, make it a more uh, seated uh, capacity um, or find somewhere else to go. Um, the Celtic end at that time, I believe, held in excess of 20,000. Um, the other end um, held uh, in excess of 18,000. Uh, the the South Stand held about, um, probably in those days, maybe about 9,000, and the jungle um, made up the rest. Um, the, first, the first problem was that we had to uh, put seats in the jungle it was mm. basically that was the, the first place that we had to deal with uh, access to it was limited egress from it was as limited uh, so we really had to start making tracks to put seats in there which we did um, uh, at the cost of, of quite a few thousands uh, in the capacity Was there a real strain on the board in, in terms of just how they were going to finance all of this you know it's, it's one thing the ruling coming in and adhering to that, but where do you find the money? You've mentioned that, you know, capital was low. So what was the, I suppose, the mood in the camp? Was there anxiety as to how the the board were ultimately going to make that move? We started to look at other alternatives. Um, there were various people out there who 
would have been happy to join the board and bring some funds to it. Um, whether they were willing to do it without um, putting a lot of time and effort into it is another story. But um, to find those funds meant that we had to somehow either get it from the bank or get someone else involved. Um, it meant obviously that the funds that were put to the ground wouldn't put into the to the team. So that made that limited as well and the results started to show the, the deficit there. Yeah. I don't know which of these events come first, but I want to talk about Kevin Kelly's Canvas Lang plan and Brian Dempsey's short-lived time on the board. So Brian Dempsey, I think, was May, May 1990 till October 1990. And he was potentially going to be the guy who came up with the the new stadium idea. So he'd land in Rob Royston, Rob I believe. Royston, yeah. And he was proposing a, a move from Celtic Park to there. And I think very quickly, and if I'm right, Michael Kelly put the brakes on that and ultimately uh, got Brian removed from the board, you know, as I say, October 1990. And is it after that that Kevin Kelly's, let's call it a, a fantasy project in Canvas Lang, came to, to light? It, it was. I mean, the, the Canvas Lang, the, the Royston um, proposal sounded fantastic um, to move the stadium out to where it's, it's currently there's loads of houses being built there now. So the, the development has gone ahead for the houses and all the other things that have gone there. But to fund the stadium was uh, pie in the sky. It, it, it was proven to be unfundable from the way it was put to us. Um, it took a long while to, to get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Brian was a very able politic, politician <clears throat> type guy um, who managed to put the, put the pieces together, but they weren't funded. So that fell through. We started to look again at alternative sales with Park and Canvas Lang was put to us. Um, I don't know if it was entirely Kevin's idea. I think Kevin was the chairman at the time and was, was landed with trying to make it happen. Um, there was a company called Super Stadia um, came to us with a proposal. They were a London-based company um, who had done various other things. And as I remember, the Canvas Lang uh, project was for a 40,000 capacity stadium. Uh, with a 10,000 arena beside it for other sports, maybe uh, basketball or ice hockey, something like that, or concerts. Um, but the, the, the actual stadium plan that they gave us was of a, a circular nature, which I didn't particularly like because um, it meant that, albeit you could alter it for bigger concerts and things like that or various other events, um, viewing it from the ends would have been... Uh, as it is at Hamden, mm. which isn't particularly attractive. Um, and the, the long ends would have to be altered at times to accommodate a football game. So I, I don't think that the shape really lent itself to a football stadium. And ultimately that f proved to be unfundable as well. So Yeah, I, I was just looking up some things on it in advance uh, of this today, Tom, and there was a suggestion it was going to be a £120 million stadium but Celtic only had to find £30 million up front to, to get the wheels in motion and the rest would be funded elsewhere. There's a quote from uh, Fergus McCann at the time. Obviously, he was making his moves at that stage to try and ultimately take control of the club. And he called it, quote-unquote, a PR exercise which consisted of a house of cards which will be financed by the fairy godmother. And he's obviously... It's good rhetoric, you know. It's, I don't know if he's taking lessons from Brian Dempsey there in terms of whipping up a frenzy. But... Ultimately, was he right, or did you believe there was something in the project, but it just couldn't get off the ground due to finances? Uh, initially, we looked at it, and we worked hard yeah. with Super Stadium. We, we did a lot of groundwork with them. Um, but Fergus is 100% right. It, it couldn't be funded. And when when it got down to the crunch, they were asked and to prove, show us the, show us the money, if you like. Um, and seemingly, there was a, a merchant bank involved, um, and they were going to be funding the bulk of it with various other... Um, individuals that are, or groups that were going to give a, give something into it. But we, we pushed and pushed for the details of that, which never, ever happened. They couldn't produce any concrete evidence that funds were going to be available. And they gave us this, though, the PR nonsense that we were given was that the merchant bank uh, didn't want to be put in a position where they were seen to be um, aiding Celtic. They wanted to stay in the background. Mm. Uh, and remain almost anonymous, um, which really didn't help us because we couldn't get any information. So that fell flat. Yeah, so the, the Canvas Lang dream, quote-unquote, I suppose, you know, there was a lot of noise in the Celtic view at the time, wasn't there? So that, that runs aground. Um, to revisit the, the Brian Dempsey situation then, Tom, do you feel that was the, the Rob Royston Stadium promo proposal ultimately 
what led to Brian becoming undone at Celtic or was there other, other things that play in the background? Uh, I think that was the alternate thing that they did it, but um, the board had become separated. Um, various groups were looking uh, to satisfy their own needs by bringing in an ally mm. or, or maybe getting rid of an enemy or a possible enemy. So um, Brian was targeted. At, uh, I think it was an AGM. Um, we didn't. We weren't aware that they were going to try and get vote Brian off. Um, but we became aware of it in the lead up to that meeting. Um, uh, we found out from one of the stewards that that I, that I employed that he'd been going around trying to get people's voting cards, counting up the votes that they could muster to, to remove Brian. And it had all been done behind the scenes before we even got there. Uh, so Brian was voted off the board that, at that, meet, that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I've read one account, I believe, um, that it was Michael Kelly and Chris White that instigated that. And I suppose the irony is that Michael Kelly and Brian arrived at the same time, you know, just five months prior. And Michael Kelly's made that move for, for whatever reason. And yeah, I believe it was, he was kind of blindsided. You know, Brian's turned Very up much expecting so. a regular meeting. And the next thing you know, he's out the door. Um, we'll maybe cover this as we go through. But do you think, Brian's obviously ultimately the guy that stands in the steps with Fergus on the 4th of March and, and utters the famous phrase, uh, the game is over, the Rebels have won. Do you feel Brian was driven by that snub in October 1990? You know, was it a, I don't know what I call it, a revenge act? It's maybe kind of selling you know, Brian Dempsey short there. But do you feel that, you know, fueled him, you know, between then and 1994? It's hard to tell. Um, I just felt that I would have felt hurt if they'd treated me that way. Um, if he wanted to deal with it in his own way, that's fine. But... Um, you would have to ask Brian. I don't. I don't really know what his his attitude was, but um, it certainly angered all of us at that time. The way it was done, um, and for the the purposes of uh, div dividing the board even further. And on that, did yourself and Jimmy Farrell, fellow director, um, you expressed your concern at that time, and almost found yourself voted off. Is that correct? Yeah, it was proposed at the time that we were. Um, Jimmy, I think they were expect, expecting him to take early retirement and I was to be removed from the board. Um, they wanted to bring in various other um, individuals. Um, uh, David Smith was coming onto the board and um, he was very much on the Chris White and Michael Kelly side of the board. So it became, the factions just grew further apart as, as time went on. Um, I, I was assured that I wouldn't be voted off um, and the, the motion, I believe, was was withdrawn eventually. Um, but the board had become so separated, so segregated, it just uh, was probably never going to work properly again. Yeah, so that division, did it end up being yourself, Jimmy Farrell, Jack McGinn, was he kind of towards yeah, your Jack, side? Yeah, Jack was always with us. Um, and the other side was Michael Kelly, Chris White and David Smith. Was Kevin Kelly somewhere in the middle? Kev, Kevin was kind in the middle. He, he didn't want to... Um, the, the Kelly connection was a problem for Kevin, mm -hmm. um, uh, with Michael being on the, the other side. So Kevin was um, left in a, the quandary whether, whether to go with one foot here or one foot there. Yeah, blood, blood thick on water and all that stuff. Aye, very much so. It was, um, and uh, people were devious. Um, you had to be aware that what you saw wasn't always what was intended. Um, we knew. Um, I had good advice from my father-in-law and my wife and various legal people who were excellent at the time mm -hmm. and we were well warned what was going on. Um, uh, so we weren't entirely blind to it. Sometimes there wasn't a lot we could do about it. but mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, obviously we're, we're celebrating, is that the right word? Celebrating a, a momentous time in Celtic's history, but there's no doubt, you know, and from the various people I've, I've spoken to so far, Tom, there was a whole lot of underhand dealings going on across the board. And I suppose when there's any sort of takeover, coup, call it what you want. There's going to be stuff of that nature going on, you know, on all sides of the yeah. fence. And yeah. I think that's that's pretty evident. Um, so let's take it back to those, you know, those kind of times in general for Celtic during the early 90s. Very much struggling on the park and there's real concerns among supporters as to what's been done about it, you know, behind the scenes to address matters on and off the park by the board. Um, the Save Our Celts supporters group, so set up by Willie Wilson and, and Jim Orr that we spoke to recently, that's created in 1991 and it's then followed up in late 93 by Celts for Change, which is Matt McGlone, Brendan Sweeney and various others. 
There's a big fans rally at the Shettleston Town Hall, uh, organised by Save Our Celtics. I've actually got the ticket here that Jim passed on. So Sunday, 24th of February, 1991, Shettleston Town Halls. Joe Boltram is there, famous Glasgow lawyer. He chairs the meeting. Brian Dempsey that we've spoken about, he speaks passionately, I believe, for half an hour or so. And yourself and Jimmy are there on behalf of the board. So what was that experience like for yourself? And were you starting to get a feeling just of, of how much discontent there was amongst the support? I, th I think we'd had the feeling of discontent for, for quite some time, but they made it very, very real and in your face. I mean, um, a lot of the the points you, you, you simply couldn't deny, they were, they were true. And you, you were faced with them, you could see what's happening on the park, um, the difficulties with the stadium, all of the things about funding. Um, the board was extremely unpopular, uh, some people more than others. Um, dealing with that was the hard thing to happen because uh, most boards of directors have a, have a way of working things that are, that you just have to do. Um, to just simply say, change doesn't always work, um, mm. no matter how much you want it. Was there a tension amongst fans to yourself and Jim that night? So there's, I think, somewhere between 350 and 400 people. Um, first and foremost, it'd be easy not to go. And I believe Chris White sent a letter quite um, dismissively to say, you're just embarrassing the club here, you know, there's no purpose to this exercise. But yourself and Jim Farrell take it upon yourself to head along. And I'm sure you met many supporters going in and out. What was their general message to you at that time? Was there, a, was there enough disgruntlement for them to you know, almost demand change of you or ask you what you're going to do but, about it, Tom? Without a doubt, when, when you see people who are so passionate about their club and so passionate about getting the change, um, it's very hard not to be sympathetic. Um, uh, you, you have to try and uh, appease them to a point saying that it's going to take time, we just can't make it happen tomorrow. We know it's urgent because the team's not performing. We don't want to lose any further ground that way. Uh, yes, you're, you're sympathetic um, and, and probably more ways than any you're, you're, you're sympathetic, but um, you have friends that are very close to you who are Celtic fans. Mm. Um, so away even from the meetings, you're, <laughs> you're not divorced from uh, people's feelings um, towards Celtic, towards yourself, towards the board members. Um, it's part of the life that we led. Uh, we went to support this club's squad from from Benbecula to Arbroath to Dundee, Glasgow, everywhere. Um, so we were very, very, we did that, Angela, my, my wife and I, uh, every week. So we were very, very aware of um, people's feelings. Um, uh, we were married in Croy. We have very good friends in the Croy Celtic Supporters Club. So we were never far away from the feelings of the fans. And Croy CSC, that was Ferguson's club, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah. So there's there's a wee link there. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's there's so much going on at the time. We've, we've covered some of the different uh, events, you know, Brian Dempsey on the board, then off the board, yourself and Jimmy Farrell having your own kind of issues about whether you'd retain your places. In the background, you've got David Lowe that you mentioned earlier on, him and I, I believe with John Keane's support are buying up shares all across the globe. Um, obviously, you, you know, you attend these meetings, supporters rallies, uh, CSC events and different things and then you're back you know in, in your day to day speaking to your fellow members on the board what's the what's the mood like at that time Tom you know is there a is there a general feeling from your colleagues that they can turn things around or you know did they feel that they could genuinely take the club forward or was there just too much going on what was was there a lot of self-preservation going on oh, there was without a doubt there was a lot of self-preservation going on um, but I think they genuinely felt that they could turn things around Um Dealing with the various people that you had to deal with, it was, it was just so many complex grey areas that people could not, they, they might have spoken nicely to you, um, but when it, it came to the crunch of putting funds on the table, it just wasn't there. Um, everyone probably had the best of intentions, or more or less the best of intentions, but mm -hmm. it wasn't going to happen. It became more aware of that. Yeah, and you know, when I was speaking to David Lowe, he, he talked about, a lot of people involved, a lot of people making a lot of noise, but ultimately it's only Fergus McCann that, that puts up the money when it comes to the crunch. You know, there's various folk that might have expressed an intention, but talk is cheap to an extent and actions do speak louder. Well, what, one guy that did put his head above the parrot was John Keane. Mm -hmm. um, I, I probably feel, I know John became chairman, but John didn't really get the credit that he deserved. Brian took the limelight, but John, John was the guy who was willing to put his hand in his pocket uh, willing to help and was a very close ally of Fergus mm -hmm. 
Um, John worked very hard at doing things. And in fact, I'm pretty sure it was John's initial deposit that uh, delayed the bank's movement until Fergus uh, transferred the rest of the funds. So it was John who organised that. And um, Fergus um, t- contacted us, um, myself and Angela. We had to meet a colleague of his, a possible investor, uh, from as far away as Uruguay. Right. And Angela and I met him in the uh, Hilton Hotel, I think it was, in Glasgow. Not Montevideo or anything uh, like that? No, no, no it was uh, uh, somewhere he was... That was Montevideo, it could have been wherever it was, but mm-hmm. it was uh, certainly... Uh, he was willing to put his hand in his pocket to the tune, I think, uh, uh, possibly a million pounds. Okay. And that was he was one of Fergus's allies. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he invested uh, with Fergus at the time. Mm. So Fergus fronts it, gathers the funds. He, he, and he had a few the, backers there, that yeah. were, but Fergus was the man that uh, everyone was relying on and uh, him and John Keane were the leading lights. Yeah, and you, you've spoken there of John Keane and John, John, you, you can't tell a story without talking about John and he seems to come out it with great credit, really well spoken of either you know from the, the folks I've chatted to or all the research I do, but you're right, he's a guy that seems to kind of have flown under the radar, you know, quite a low key uh, person by all accounts, but very highly thought of. I think Celtic had him in to raise the flag in 2013, yep. which I'm sure was a great honour. And I think he very much deserves his place in Celtic history for for what he done. Um, so we spoke about Fergus McCann briefly there, and I believe he's been trying to make headway into Celtic since the late 80s, around about 1988. He's come in and made different proposals, and people have been happy to welcome him in as such, but not to take things any further. Can you tell us, Tom, when you first became aware of Fergus and what your relationship like was with him during these early times? Uh, first I heard of Fergus was from Jack, Jack McGinn. Um, I think Fergus's company was called First Green. Um, I'd been based in uh, America, Arizona and Canada. Um, uh, he sold uh, exclusive golf packages and had obviously done it very, very well. Um, and the proposal that he'd given to Jack was that he uh, put some money into the club, uh, not a lot at the time, I can't remember the exact figure, but he wanted to come and run the place as chief executive, basically, um, but only to do it for six months of the year. Uh, the other six months of the year, he wanted to remain in America and, and Canada. Um, he would work very hard in that time, but we, we just felt that anyone who's going to commit to the club had to commit full time to the club. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a part time job. Um, it required all of your attention to, to make anything work. So we we didn't do anything with Fergus at the time, but it kept in touch um, with various elements of the board. Um, so we were always aware that he was keen to do things, and then eventually when we got to know him better, he came back with uh, firm proposals that would have taken us forward, but it was to do the whole stadium, to, to rebuild. It was a, the proper job to do the whole thing. And he knew how to do it. It is five year plan that he stuck to, uh, very well structured, um, and determined to do what he, what he wanted to do. If I've got my details roughly correct, I think he came in with proposals something in the ballpark of seventeen million that he put to the board, which was rejected. And I also believe there's obviously other parties involved at that time, and it's the Jerry Weisfeld, Willie Hockey, Michael McDonald consortium. They've also got a different proposal on the go. Why were none of those two proposals accepted at the time, Tom? What was the, the reasons for that? I think I think at the time, um, the Fergus proposal um, would probably be rejected because it would probably have meant, meant the removal of everyone on the board. And for all of us to have step, stepped aside would have been difficult. Uh, some of us were more willing to do so than others. Um, the second proposal from, from Willie Hawking and Gerald Weisfeld was... Um, simply to buy our shares and for their involvement, uh, really to, uh, nothing to do with Fergus. Um, I would have always favoured working with Fergus. Um, the, 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 the Hockey and Weissel proposal was worth a lot of money. Um, Kevin and I were asked to attend a meeting through in Edinburgh, um, which I believe Michael Kerr and Chris White attended. I refused to go. Kevin um, made himself unavailable. Um, and... After that, we said that we wouldn't deal in any shape or form with what Willie Hawkey and Gerald Weisfeld. The sums of money that they were offering was certainly in excess of £300 a share. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a lot of money to all, anyone involved at the time. Um, but 
we didn't see that as a, a way forward. Um, so we rejected it. Did you always feel at some point that Fergus would ultimately be the the right fit for Celtic? Yeah, Fergus was very determined um, uh, to the point. When it, uh, this was before mobile phones and um, I was playing 10-pin bowling one night up in Cumbernauld and he phoned my home and in turn, Angela, my wife, had phoned me at the 10-pin bowling alley. You need to come home, Fergus wants to speak to you. Headed home and uh, he said he was really putting things together now. It was time to take action. It was had gone on too long. Um and from then on, things really started to kick off. It became much more intense. Um, and Fergus was much more on the scene and he, he made himself more available. And have you got a situation there, Tom, where Fergus and his group are trying to, you know, win favour with yourself and Jim and Jim Farrell and Jack McGinn, whereas the, the Weisfeld Hockey Consortium, are they in, in tow with or in cahoots with the other side of the board? Is that well, is it as simple as that? Um, I felt they were. Um, Chris White, Michael and David Smith would happily have taken their money. They would happily have sold the shares, um, which they were entitled to do. Um, I, I had no intention of doing that, and I, I don't believe Kevin had either. Um, so that kind of set down a, a conflict in the board as well, um, which eventually was resolved partly um, by the format of this Packed that we agreed. Um, Chris White, Michael Kelly, Kevin, and myself signed a, an agreement. David Smith didn't sign because he didn't want to be part of it, um, but it was him that um, instigated it. Um, the pact meant that rather than vote against each other, we voted as one. Um, if a, any of us wanted to vote against the others, then you would be removed. Um, if you wanted to sell your shares, you had to offer them to the other members of the pact first. So it, it meant that conflict as such meant that we should all have been pushing towards the, the club mm -hmm. being number one as opposed to any individual requirements. Um, we got a lot of stick for, for that, but um, the great thing about it was it was eventually the instrument that, that broke the, the deadlock. Yeah, I think... I think David Lowe described it as a Warsaw Pact. Would that be the yeah, kind of right pretty accurate term think I terminology? Think. Um, designed to ensure, I suppose, designed to ensure there was no rogue moves. I suppose would that be the, the general? It was a kind of like a Berlin Wall as well. It was a block, um, and it, it meant that we all had to behave within it, um, which was difficult for all the individuals involved. Did it, did it show? I suppose the very fact that the, the pact came to be, as you say, maybe the the instigation of a uh, sorry. David Smith. D David Smith. David yeah. Smith, yeah, my yeah. mistake. Um, did it show then the fact that that was proposed in the first place? Did it show the, the distrust amongst you all as a, a collective? Uh, there, was, there was no trust whatsoever. Um, when I when I joined the board way back in, when, when Desmond White and Tom Devlin and Jimmy Farrell were there, the, the, the element of trust was supreme. He trusted everyone. It, was, it just was a, never questioned that. Uh, whereas nowadays as in the board, you were saying... Uh, you looked behind every decision, every suggestion. You looked for something, something not right. You knew there was another, another meaning behind it, another desire behind it. So there, there was no, no trust at all. Do you feel, and you don't need to name names as such, but do you feel certain people changed since you first started working with them on the board in 1985 until that big change in '94? Yeah, um, other people became involved. Um, with with individuals, um, Chris I always felt was kind of caught in the headlights. Um, he'd become he he got married. His wife I believe was a solicitor, quite influential. Um, Michael was um, in some ways a bit of a bully towards Chris. Um, Chris really just wanted to get on with things, but uh, conflict was not in his nature. Mm. Um, uh, whereas I think Michael enjoyed conflict. Uh, but Chris was a, a a guy who just really wanted to wanted the best for Celtic, but didn't want the conflict to go with it. David Smith was kind of caught, and I don't I don't think he realised at the time that he was going to cause the the conflict that he was part of. Um, but he would have accepted, I believe, the the Weisfeld and Hockey money. He would have mm -hmm. moved on. Uh, he was one of the we all inherited our shares. He actually bought his share, so fair dues to him for that. 
Yeah, and uh, David Smith, I believe, just came in in 1992. So he maybe thought within a particularly turbulent couple of years, <laughs> might have thought, you know what, I don't need this. Maybe I'm going to jump ship. But you're talking about, you know, conflict. You know, it's it's not for everybody, of course it's not. But Michael Kelly comes in at the same time as Brian Dempsey and five months later he's instigating a coup. So that maybe tells you that he's a guy who not thrives on it, but certainly sees the opportunity, you know, that that conflict might might bring. Um, so to stay on Brian Dempsey uh, and take us right up to date on the, the 4th of March, 1994, as I say, he utters the famous words, the game is over, the Rebels have won. He's on the steps of Celtic Park along with Fergus McCann. And obviously, Fergus, you know, in the lead up to that, he's made that rumoured £1 million deposit to the Bank of Scotland to keep them at bay, at least temporarily. Um, and he then makes his way with David Lowe that afternoon up to Celtic Park to thrash things out with, I presume, yourself and, and the rest of the board. What's that that meeting like? So I suppose there's a whole afternoon. I think he comes out about 11 o'clock at night. So there's a lot, lot of time to fill there uh, to try and you know iron out what the future of Celtic is going to look like. And between yourself and the, the various other board members, Fergus, uh, David Lowe and, and various others from their side, Brian Dempsey, is it tense? Is there anger around? Is there raised voices? What's the, uh, what's the vibe? There weren't any raised voices as such, but there, you know, there, was, there was probably more lawyers there than um, anything else, um, certainly as many as there were for the press. Um, there, there was a feeling of that something had to be done, that had to be finished that, that night, it had to be put to dust. Um, the the bank had really said to Celtic, uh, to the directors, um, if the the debts hadn't been repaid, if it hadn't been squared off, they would issue, um, uh, they'd call us personal, personally responsible for it, mm-hmm. which after one was, was never going to be able to afford, and I don't think any of the others would have been either. So the bank had put pressure on us from from that point of view, um, and the deposit that Fergus, uh, like a John Keane, um, had put in with the bank, uh, they were willing to accept that as the starter until Fergus came up with the rest of the funds. Um, but the the whole thing really got to came to a head where uh, we'd met in one of the uh, lawyers' offices over in the, the, the south side of the Clyde and. Um, at that time, Kevin and I were basically tutored on how to go about um, presenting the facts that we wanted to the others. Um, and we had to follow that script very, very carefully. It had to be a certain sequence that we had to follow. And that was calling for the removal of David Smith and Chris White. Um, and uh, strangely enough, not Michael Keller, but Kevin didn't want to, to push that side of the family issue um, but all of those details had more or less been resolved um, Fergus had uh, made the Kellys and the Whites or Chris White in particular him and his, his uh, aunt had made them an offer for, for their shares which they found acceptable and um, the same offer was made to Michael Kelly um, which he had to be a little bit more convinced of um, and when all of that was done and dusted and the lawyers were happy with it um, the sequence carried on um, and Fergus got his way Was Brian Dempsey ever actually on the board? Did that happen? He was on the board but he'd been removed at the, an EGM um, Not it wasn't on the board at that time but previously he'd been removed from it Yeah, sorry, I mean yeah. uh, Fergus time was he ever part of Fergus's board or did that come to fruition? Uh, I don't think so, no he wasn't on the board at that time, no uh, Willie Hockey became a mem- uh, director for a time but yeah. um, he moved on or was moved on yeah and I've, I've caught some of that detail Willie Hockey moves on in 1997 and uh, real conflicting stories as to why that was I believe he was in Tommy Burns camp and there's something on that but that's a different story for a, a different part of the, the series and what, what's the shake up for yourself then Tom so yourself Kevin Kelly Jim Farrell um, and maybe Jack McGinn do you remain as part of the, the new Celtic uh, yeah um I've got some interesting photographs there of us all that night after it. Um, Dominic Keane was part of it. Um, no relation to John. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously Fergus. Um, we were all pictured in one of the Celtic lounges. Um, uh, and then it was a case of getting a new board together, um, filling the spaces of the that had been created. Um, I remained on it for a while and Jimmy Farrell remained on it. Kevin, we all did and then we all kind of moved on and 
Um, a new board was set up, new members come in, um, and this shows how that, that's worked out. Yeah. How do you feel yourself, and, and I, I suppose I mean both in a professional capacity and, and the role that you had at Celtic, and as a fan, because ultimately, Tom, what's very evident here is that Celtic is... Celtic has been in your life from from day dot. You know, it's been in your family from day dot. So how do you feel as a fan there? You know, you're you're entering and in, into an exciting new era. There's obviously a state of flux as well in terms of what you're doing professionally. So what's your your overriding emotions on that evening of the fourth of March? The light that the the conflict is finished. Um, the light that um, fans outside are delirious. They're deliriously happy. So that's obviously a good sign. Um, Fergus being on board, you know, it's. He's a very able person, so things are going to kick off, hopefully, for the best. Um, I, I think I was still more concerned that we still had something to do with the, with the stadium, which was was my concern. And we still hadn't ironed out that that problem. And Fergus had um, ideas on it and plans for it, but they, they had to be put into fruition. We had to start that happening. Uh, so it was a case of getting things back to normal, Um Getting the board, I, I wasn't too bothered about that being part of the board anymore. I'd become resigned to the fact that I wasn't going to be part of it long term, albeit for a short term I was, but I knew I would be moving on. Uh, and I was more than satisfied to be involved in the, the reconstruction and the, the building side of it. Yeah, so you, you take on the role of stadium manager uh, in the aftermath and you oversee the development of the new Celtic Park until you eventually move on in July 96. 11 years at Celtic, Tom, and... There's the ups and the downs and the and the everything in between, but there must be a sense of pride in in having worked on the new Celtic Park, a place where you, you know you still attend to this very day. It, it was an incredible time. It's very hard to explain. Um, um, all that was left of Celtic Park was the South Stand. Um, there was nothing, no Celtic End Rangers in, no jungle. Everything was gone. It looks as if Hiroshima has has happened in the East End of Glasgow. Uh, at one stage there wasn't even a, a pitch we lifted the pitch and did the drainage and set, uh, under soil heating so there was nothing um, I was based in a port of cabin at the uh, west end west end east end of the, the stand um, myself and George Douglas the security guy um, we were in there so our, our daily life um, piles being driven into the ground steelwork arriving concrete arriving um, but even then I've got to say that the kick and the thrill you get out of walking out the Celtic Park Tunnel mm -hmm. even when there was nothing surrounding you um, and not a soul anywhere near you're always going to get a thrill out of walking out that tunnel Yeah absolutely You've got some amazing photos from that time you mentioned a photo from the night of the 4th of March but um, again as part of the research here I kind of stumbled into what's an incredible collection of photos on the Celtic Star website and they're, they're there right now for anyone that wants to check them out and how did they all come to be? So the, the pictures, you know, it shows the, the demolition of the jungle. It shows you when there's no park, as you mentioned, and, and just the front facade and, and what we now know of the main stand. Um, there's all the construction, there's there's diggers, there's all sorts going on. Was that just something you chose to document from the start of the project? Uh, my wife would tell you I'm a nightmare with a camera. I, I've always wandered about with a camera everywhere we go. I take photographs, thousands of them. But as part of my daily routine, you would wander about, and I would I would take photographs of things the way that I knew they were they had been, and hopefully uh, you could be able to take photographs later on and how they, they had turned out. I, I did it kind of unconsciously. I didn't do it as a as a record as such, um, but I did it when we when we started work at the Barrafield Training Ground um, years previously. I, I did all the same stuff there, um, and I. I just happen to wander about with a camera on a daily basis, I guess. Yeah, and I think we're, we're all seeing the benefits. <laughs> what was the, the line about the the toilets at the jungle? They they hold a not particularly appealing record. For oh, those. The longest urinals in Europe. The longest urinals in Europe. So we weren't winning much on the park, but with the longest toilets Europe, in Europe. So yeah. we were doing something right. But no, I'll, I'll maybe tie in with you separate, Tom, and we could maybe access some of those photos sure. and share with some of sure. our listeners, which would be great. Um, you've mentioned that special feeling. Um, and I've experienced this myself where you, you, you walk down the tunnel at Celtic Park and you experience an empty Celtic Park and there's a, I don't know if it, eeriness is the word, but there's certainly a special feeling, you know, when that goes on. So you've obviously experienced that at different times during your 11 years at the club, but ultimately what's your feelings as you walk the other way? You walk out the front doors at Celtic Park around about July 96, knowing that that chapter in your life is over. Um, 
in some ways relief, um, but pride. Um, happy to see that I, I was pretty sure things were going to work out. Mm-hmm. Fergus was uh, so adamant that he, he knew what he was doing. Um, so when, when you when you leave to do other things, uh, there's a just a, I suppose a little bit of a relief. It, it didn't strike me so much at the time, um, but looking back on it, it probably affected my wife more than more than most because. Celtic was was a life, man. I I, I was there. I mean, I, on a match day, if we had a match in the evening, I could be there from eight in the morning to eleven o'clock midnight. Um, and she had to put up with it. I, I travelled abroad with the team. I, um, I travelled abroad with the youth teams, and all of it was pleasurable. But she was left at home most of the time. Um, so she had to put up with me on a daily basis, being being elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and I think if again a few of the folks that we've spoken to so far. That's always come through, you know. There's there's great moments, there's highs and lows, but there's the kind of ongoing stresses and strains of something which it's not just any other business, is it? There's the emotional attachment to Celtic, and and there's no doubt that could you know take its toll on on anybody. So I can absolutely um, get on board with that, Tom. What about now? So we were chatting before coming on there. I believe you still get along to Celtic Park and in, in the North Stand, and you know get along to kind of back the team, you know, throughout the season. What do you think of Celtic's overall success then in those? 30 years or so that have followed your time at the club? Uh, the, the, the good times have been absolutely superb. There's been a, a number of bad times involved, but that happens at every football club. Um, that's that's only life, the way the cards are dealt to you. Uh, the, the, the league championship wins um, are superb. They're always to be treasured. I'm so sitting at 53 of them now, um, and I would hope that we'll, we'll be able to build in that. Uh, when it comes to Europe, we obviously need to do more to make the name uh, worthy in, in Europe again. It, it certainly hasn't at this stage in time. Um, and I'm disappointed in the, like most Celtic fans and the way things have gone in the last few months. Um, the, the lack of investment, um, the old board would have been slaughtered for it. Um, whatever the reason for the lack of investment in team is, uh, I hope it doesn't cost us at the end of this season. You know, I suppose you're in a unique position, Tom, where so most of us, just as regular fans, we're jumping up and down, kicking and screaming about the lack of investment. But I suppose a huge part of it is the fact that we just don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Now, I can't think of any good reason why not to invest, but there may be you know, reasons why or we've just been unlocking the transfer market or players haven't been available and things of that nature. But to an extent, having sat at that side of the table, can you empathise with the current board in terms of the some of the flack that's coming their way? Um, up to a point, yes, because um, I know Peter Law gets a lot of criticism, but there's been a lot of success in Peter's time there. Um, uh, there's been a lot of uh, funds spent unwisely. Um, that happens. Um, it's not always directors that buy players. Um, they're generally their name might go in the check or something that eventually turns it over. But it's generally managers that choose players. Now we have recruitment staff that seem to be doing that. Um, there's an awful lot of money being wasted. Um, there's an awful lot of money in the bank. I think the feeling is that we, we need to invest in the team. Um, we, we have to bring the name back to some sort of glory in Europe. Um, I'm not expecting us to be champions of Europe anytime soon, but uh, it's been embarrassing the, the last few years. If... If what you read through the, the lines is they, they tried to buy players, but the players they wanted weren't available at the time they wanted them, then that may give them some breathing space. But if the manager is, is asking for players and funds and not getting it for whatever reason, then the fans have got every right to be disgruntled, unhappy. Yeah, and I suppose with, you can, sometimes you just, you just don't, don't know. know. You just don't know, and we just need, just need to guess in I, between. I wish time. there would be a wee bit more forthcoming but again we were guilty of not being forthcoming at the time as well um, the other side of it is that the the South Stand is an ageing stand yeah and um, we're doing a lot of work at Barfield which is due to be completed by the end of the year I believe mm-hmm. so there's been, been investment there which is, is much needed but uh, the facilities in the South Stand are still very dated the original steelwork from I think 1929 is is still at the basis of, albeit it's been strengthened and reinforced and modernised, but um, uh, that's going to require work 
at some point. So maybe they're they're concerned that they need to find sizable funds to be able to do that. I doubt if the club would be able to do that without borrowing or finding a, a very lucrative sponsor somewhere. Yeah, and, and there might well be something to that. And you mentioned earlier, Tom, the fact that when you as a board were looking for money for the stadium, it meant there wasn't a lot to play with in terms of the playing personnel. Now the club have got themselves in a position, and it's listen, it's a very healthy position, 70 odd million in the bank, that they can potentially do both. But you're right in terms of, you know, the, the front facade of Celtic Park was developed in time for the centenary season. So what's that now, 36 years ago, something yeah. like that. So maybe there's there's work to be done there. Underneath the main stand, it's very, very tired, you know, toilets and different facilities there. So maybe, you know, they are planning stuff there. But I think what you've got now, and I suppose it's worlds away in terms of where you guys were 30 odd years ago, there's millions of pounds swimming about. But just as a fan, I don't think it's unfair or unhealthy to be demanding high standards from Celtic. We understand that sometimes when it comes to player negotiations and different things, sometimes it's just not possible, but you would just like to see a wee bit more done on and off the park. It's just it's just natural, you know, as a fan to want that, isn't yeah, it? Very much so. I mean, I, I enjoy the good times, the cup wins and the league championship wins as, as much as anyone. Um, and I, I think, having seen the good times in Europe, um that's probably the thing that hurts most, that we're, we're not the force in Europe that we once were. And I appreciate that Scotland's a, a small country, we've got limited funds, I appreciate all of that. But I think like most Celtic fans, particularly guys of my age are, are similar, that um, we should be doing better. Um, the, the other possible example is that if you look at, for instance, Everton Football Club down south, um, performing badly in the league and have done for a number of seasons, going from manager to manager, and yet they're building a massive new stadium on the, the banks of the Mersey. Um, that investment will be massive, albeit it might be banks and other sponsors involved in that as well. But um, if I was an Everton fan just now, I'd be pretty sick um, that you see club a club like that um, crippling itself in some way. Um, so I would like to think that whatever we do, um, the greatest pleasure I get is green and white ribbons on a trophy. So... Mm. Um, I hope the board remember that yeah of course and, and listen the, the, we can't discount the domestic success it's, it's been phenomenal in the 30 years and Celtic have more or less dominated during that time and great credit for that but like yourself Tom you, you do hope for a wee bit more uh, success in Europe we're now what 20 more than 20 years since Seville let's see at some point if we can get back to something akin to that Tom as we start to close out the recording um, I just want to finish with a, a kind of final question on your own time at the club and it's twofold so Question one, do you have any regrets from your time? And question two, what are you most proud of from your time? Uh, I don't really have any regrets. Um, I, I regret at times when we had to change managers. Um, at times you built up pretty close relationships with people. For instance, Billy McNeil, David Hay, um, even Liam Brady, uh, over the relatively short time Liam was there. Um, it was a horrible thing to have to do to dispense with someone's services especially if they were such loyal people to the club um, so that that was always difficult the personal level was always difficult doing things like that um, albeit you've got the utmost respect for them after it but it's a difficult thing to do um, the level of pride I get every time I walk into the place I walk down the road when we walk down from uh, Duke Street um, and you see Celtic Park um, above the skyline there it's Superb. Um, so every time I see that, I'm pretty proud. Yeah, and do you know, I think that's a perfect note to finish on, Tom. Tom, thanks for being so kind of your time and joining us here on the Celtic Exchange today and for sharing your story. The Battle to Save Celtic covers one of the most important times in the club history, and it's really interesting to get that insight from yourself and a, a really unique angle on events at that time. So thanks again, Tom, and all the best. Pleasure, thank you.